Frankie, thanks for joining us. Tell us about how you first got into the sport of cycling. I started racing when I was like 10 years old. Uh, my first nationals where I competed in was 1976 and I got into it. My dad used to just ride the bike and I saw him going out riding his bike and I said, hey, I'll, let me come along with you. And so I started just kind of riding and kind of going around with him and I enjoyed it. Uh, I liked being outside. I liked kind of just kind of riding. And then the, the cycling club that he belonged to was going to start a racing team. So he came and asked me, you know, hey, you interested in trying to, you know, race in bikes? And I was like, sure, let's go do it. And it was, it was fun. I just, I loved being outside and racing. It was a good group of people. So everything about it was positive. And was it a sport you watched a lot on television and thought, I want to be a part of that? No, not at all. I didn't even know about the Tour de France. I didn't know there was even races in Europe. I was just doing uh, the local races and, and having fun and traveling around with my group of friends and, and doing the races. And that, really, that continued all the way until 15, 16 years old. Still, I thought the races that I was attending and going to were the biggest races in the world. You know, those were the most important, the ones I was doing. I had no idea about Europe. I didn't have, uh, you know, uh, famous European cycling posters on my wall, no cycling magazines. No cycling idol. No, I just raced. I love, it was just fun. It was just fun. And so it wasn't until maybe, you know, 17, 18, where, uh, well, let's say the first time Greg LeMond won the tour, became a little bit more aware of, well, hey, there's this whole thing over in Europe. There's more of this European racing. There's Greg LeMond who just won the Tour de France, uh, where I realized that, you know, someone can be a professional in cycling. At the time, when I first started, I, had, I was just racing. Looking at your career in cycling, what achievements are you most proud of? Uh, I mean, I made two Olympic teams, which, which I was uh, definitely a big, big goal. Because when I was an amateur, or when I was young, you dream of the Olympics. Uh, you know, I had a couple wins uh, when I was professional here and there. But some, actually, my role many times was as a domestique, was as a worker. To work very hard to help another person win. And definitely, I can remember many times getting as emotional when my teammate won because of the work that I did as when I would win. And so I really got satisfaction out of uh, helping like, someone on my team win. When you took banned substances yourself, did you feel guilty or was it a, a necessary to you at the time? At the time, you felt like you didn't have a choice because it seemed, it seemed like everyone was doing it. And ultimately, I do have a choice. Ultimately, it was my decision, and I do have a choice. It was yes or no. The no part would have meant I had to go home. You know, I wouldn't have been able to be a professional bike rider. And the yes part was I took EPO and I, to, to stay in the Peloton. And I limited it at that. I didn't, there was a lot of talk and a lot of rumors about all these other kind of products, from steroids to growth hormone, to RNESP and, you know, things with numbers and codes. And uh, I wasn't comfortable with a lot of that. I just, I just wanted to keep racing my bike. And so I ended up taking EPO, which was, you know, a, a horrible decision. But at the time, you felt trapped. As a cyclist in the 90s, you, you felt trapped. If you could turn back the clock, what things would you have done differently? If I could turn back the clock... Back in 1993 or 95, if there was some place to turn to, when you got into a situation where you felt like you didn't have a choice to be able to take uh, a doping product, to, to have some place to turn and not, I don't to alleviate some, maybe some of that pressure that, that you felt and having to, to, and to, to go that direction. And back then, I don't, there was nothing really, there was nobody out there, there was no agencies or anybody to speak with about trying to uh, not go down the wrong path, you know? And I think that's important now, and that's a big difference that I think WADA makes. Would you accept that all these years later with an anti-doping industry in place, if you like, people do have that choice to speak out and will feel more comfortable doing so? I think the mentality of the journalists, uh, the fans, even the athletes, the managers, uh, the it's not tolerated. Before, you just turned a blind eye. It was accepted. It was kind of part of it. It was tolerated. Now, it, I, I feel that's not the case. And I think a lot of it is because of 
um, the job that USADA has done, the job that WADA has done, not only, not only in punishing uh, the offenders, punishing the cheats, but also in getting the message out that there is some place to turn, there's some place that you can trust. In which areas can the sport of cycling continue to make progress with anti-doping? Compared to five years ago, compared to 10 years ago, they've made an incredible amount of progress. Uh, leaps and bounds compared to how it used to be. Um, you know, they've increased their frequency of testing. Um, you know, they have the whereabouts system, so there's out of competition testing. You know, having, I think, also uh, an information kind of hotline that athletes can turn to to call up in order that uh, they can report, you know, things that they've seen that they don't think is, is correct that, you know, regards with uh, other athletes trying to cheat. But I think there's been a lot of progress made, and I think this, the sport of cycling has done a lot to be able to make uh, itself uh, a better reputation than what it's, what it's deserved because it's actually it earned itself its own horrible reputation. It's, it's just a shame that uh, everything that went on in the 90s is going to cast that spell for another, could be 10 or 15 years. So as someone that works in the media when you, when you watch cycling races, is there a certain degree of suspicion still? Definitely. Yeah, there's definitely suspicion because I've been, all of us have been burned so many times before. I think it would be very naive not to be suspicious and kind of watching and analyzing and figuring it out. And, and, then, and then also you have to give it some time. But as time goes by, you're going to start being able to believe in the athletes because I believe there's a new crop of younger riders and uh, that are not taking products, not, not doping. They want a clean environment. They don't want to have to deal with needles. And that's, I think that's, that's, that's the most important job that USADA and WADA are doing. And they can feel confident. And that's the thing. With the two organizations can give these athletes confidence to be able to say, no, I don't want to do that. Since you retired from, from cycling, you've turned to motivational speaking, writing, work in the media. How difficult was it for you to make the transition and, and how difficult in general is it for athletes when they retire to think of what the next thing is? I, I think as an athlete, when you're competing, you don't think about the next step. You're, you're, you're in a bubble. You're focused on the environment that you're in, which is I'm a professional athlete, I'm, I'm racing, I'm, I'm, you're just, you're not, you're, you don't think about the, the after part because in your head, until you start really, until you start performing badly, you think you're going to keep at that level forever, and you're just going to be able to keep competing. And obviously, that's not you know that's not the truth. As we're sitting here in 2015, what do you think the anti-doping movement really needs to do to get on top of this issue once and for all? I don't believe that'll ever happen because it doesn't matter that it's sport. It could be business, agriculture. It doesn't matter whatever industry someone's in. There's always somebody cutting corners and cheating. And that's the same way that it's going to be in sport. And so um, I, I think, you know, just continuing to test and, and, and target individuals. I also think really the more outspoken the two agencies uh, can be, I think that it helps kind of give a, a kind of a, a shield or, or a cape to an athlete for knowing that they can stand up and say no and they'll have the backing of the two organizations. And, that, and I think that's really important too, that if somebody does gonna speak up, if there is gonna be a whistleblower, if they're gonna point something out, they don't wanna feel like they're just out there by themselves and they're just thrown to the wolves and they're gonna start getting attacked from every individual way. They need the backing of USADA and WADA and the organizations to be able to, to, to help support what they're trying to do, which is clean it up. Frankie Andrea, thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you.